or here. Reasons the Eagle defense might struggle in 2023. I said identity. What will we see? The identity. Will it be again? Bend but don't break? How are the new faces going to be used? How are they going to implement them? What, what kind of rotation are they going to have when it comes to their defensive tackles? Who's starting? Who's not? How are you using Nolan Smith? By the way, Nolan Smith looks pretty good out there running around. I'm excited about him. Here's the third one. So it's about Sean Desai. His background. His defensive mentality. Mel Tucker. Vic Fangio. Being around Pete Carroll. I would say this to you. Pete Carroll's an aggressive D coordinator. What is he? If I am going to sit there and say, what kind of defense is Sean Desai going to put in Philadelphia this year? I think it's going to be a cross between Pete Carroll's style and Vic Fangio's style and a little bit of Mel Tucker. And if you, Mel Tucker's the head football coach at Michigan State. I think you're going to see a little bit of this. And here's why and why I go here with this. What does Carroll believe in the most? He believes in pressure. He believes in corner play. And he believes in what? Safety setting the tone. I'll tell you something that I'm hearing a lot of good comments comments about is Sidney Brown. I'm hearing a lot of good comments that they think this kid, Sidney Brown. And and if you listen to Lovey Smith, Lovey Smith is using the words warrior, tough, leader, attitude. Everything I want to hear in a safety. Boy, how come I feel and how come I'm starting to get a sense? And can I tell you what Lovey told me? Lovey goes, Sills, this guy's a little Cam Chancellor. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, he's like a little, he's like, he feels like Cam Chancellor. I was like, oh, wait a minute. You think he's that, like that good? I go, I think he's that tough. He brings the wood. Like, this guy's going to hit you. Like, Don't be shocked if you see him get fined this year for hitting people across the middle. He's like, I'm like, okay, so you think he's a tone setter? I go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I can't tell you how many times he had helmet to helmet this past year at Illinois, all the games I watched. There's a new head coach in there now, the guy uh, who used to be the Wisconsin head coach. But Lovey goes, every time I watch him, this guy's getting um, a targeting – he, he's, he's getting questioned on targeting. I'm like, well, okay. Well, you know, I like the kid Witherspoon. He goes, oh, he's a fabulous player, but this guy's a tone setter. Okay. He's going to hit you. I was like, Cam Chancellor. That's the first time I had ever thought about that. He goes, yeah, take a look at Cam Chancellor and how Cam played. And then look at Sydney, how he plays. That's what we used to say at Illinois all the time. He's got, a Cam, he's got a Cam Chancellor vibe about him and the way he plays. Okay, and I was I was going like, all right. And all you're hearing is people saying that that's the kind of guy you have to have in a Sean Desai, Pete Carroll, Vic Fangio defense. You've got to have a guy set the tone back there. You've got to have a guy who's going to knock the snot bubbles out of people and then the rest takes care of itself. That would be the first safety that they've had back there like that in a long time. That's going to knock the shit out of you. CJ did knock the shit out of you because he was in the slot. But you got a guy that can knock the shit out of you now. I was very pleasantly, I was present, I was, I was pleasantly surprised when I heard that comparison. That he, when Lovey Smith compared him to Cam Chancellor, 
And he goes, well, look at, look at Sean Desai's background. He's got Mel Tucker's coached him, Vic Fangio and Pete Carroll. So all those guys had what in common? Tone setting safeties. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most of the time when you have, yeah, Brian Dawkins, obviously. <laughs> hey, I would say this weapon. Yes, Gardner Johnson was a ball hawk, but most of the time when you have ball hawk guys, they're not usually great hitters. You got a guy here who's a hitter. You know what he's looking to do? He's not looking really much for the football. He's looking to take your head off. And looking to set a message to you, I I, I had a really I, I love I, I've known Lovey. I've known Lovey Smith since Tampa, and he he knows personnel. Look at look, almost every single one of his defensive backs got drafted last year from that Illinois team that he recruited. Okay, and he said that this kid here was his, one of his favorite players that he's ever coached. The, the, the way that he brought the wood okay um i would say this too how is this defense with all the new faces how long will it take to gel here's what i would do if I was the Psy, I wouldn't try to inflict a will of a structured defense in this defense. Do you know what I would do? I would let the players go out and take care of business themselves first. Here, and hence what I'm saying to you is this. Don't fuck it up. Go out, put your structure in. Put what you want as a parameter of how you want it to look. Make it look a little like last year. And you know what I would do? I would change because I have Pete Carroll, Vic Fangio, and Mel Tucker type mentality. To me, the great coaches today, especially the great coordinators, I'm not going to do this, guys, to you. I'm not going to do this. This is the kind of defense that we're going to run here. This is what we're going to try to implement here. I'm going to go like this. Let's go play some ball. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to start taking notes. Okay, we need a little bit better at the cornerback position. So maybe we slide the safety over to the right. And this is how you put a, put a boutique defense together. You change. You don't change the personnel you have. You go to what the personnel is on the field. This is what I think is different. Okay? This is what I think is different in today's NFL when it comes to coaching. In the past, coordinators, offensively and defensively, had a system. They wanted you to run it. See, this is why your favorite coordinator, Jim Johnson, was always ahead of the game. Jim was so far ahead that he would be a fabulous D coordinator today. He would because Jim Johnson's not going to sit there and go with a 4-3 defense. That's not what he's going to do. He's going to look at the personnel that he's been given from Howie Roseman. And by the way, these are the kind of coaches that the Eagles love. Guys are like Sean Desai. How he gives them a roster, how he gives them the players, and it's up to the coaches to put those players in, in position to win. That's why Howie doesn't want you interfering with the personnel on the football field. He wants you to figure out the personnel that their department has brought in, the kind of style of play they want, the kind of attitude they want, the kind of player they want. And it's up to the coaches to come up with a way to put them into a system. That's why they have no say in the personnel. Don't anybody, you know, I, I, I the size said the defense should match the city's attitude. Well, weapon. That's what Howie does. Howie drafts people that represent you guys too, in a way. Quality people, not, not real jackasses. I mean, the coaches don't sign guys anymore. The personnel departments, this is why this new wave coach is in the game today. And hey, listen, and 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 tone, no disrespect. But I, I I heard the sports take guys talking about Nick Sirianni. Boy, they give that guy way too much credit. I don't think he has anything to do with anything. I think he's a babysitter. 
I think he's a really good babysitter. A guy has no say in coaching when it comes to the assistant coaches. They hire all the head coaches, the front office. They hire all the assistant coaches. They hire all the personnel. Hell, they even have an idea what kind of game plan they want. The coach is there to make it work and to make everything. Now, I do think this, that Nick's kind of like a CEO of it. And he's kind of like been hired as the CEO. But they can fire his ass like they can Andy Reid at any moment. If it doesn't start, hey, by the way, we'll find out how. Hey, you guys were asking for his head when he was two and five. Callie Green goes, <coughs> players love him. Yeah, players love him. Why? Because he's on their side. He's trying to help them win because they're helping him win. Okay, it goes hand in hand. And the front office has all to say. So you are you are you under some sort of notion that it was Doug Peterson that threw that last game of the year when you guys tanked that game at the end of the year three years ago? Or do you think it was Howie in the front office that tanked that game? Head coaches aren't going to tank a game. Front offices are. Trying to get a better draft choice, don't want to pay incentives, whatever. I mean, so you think Doug Peterson just tanked the game and started yanking starters? Every coach wants to win a ball game. And, and here's a prime example of it. Speaking of Lovey Smith, Lovey gave it to the Texans last year when he won that final game. And the Bears ended up getting the number one overall pick. The Bears ended up trading out of that with Carolina. But Lovey, Lovey won that final game of the year against what the front office wanted. I mean, say what you will. Coaches don't get into profession to tank games. But see, Nick gets it. Nick, Nick, Nick understands the environment. Hey, to go along, you get along. And you do what here, here, what's Nick Sirianni? What do you actually believe is Nick Sirianni's role? What do you think is the Nick? What what do you think is Nick Sirianni's role on the Eagles? What what, what just curious what you think his role is? Do you actually really believe that he surrendered to play calling? I don't believe that. I think it was taken from him because he was two and five. For him just to go, hey, you know what? I'll stop. Though when, when you, you you don't deviate off a plan like that in seven games of your coaching career, it was taken from him. The Eagles saved his coaching career because if Nick would have kept going as a play caller, he'd have been fired. He'd have been fired. And personally, Shane Steichen was better in the RPO than what Nick was. That's how I think that decision was made. And that's how I think Steichen got the job in Indianapolis because he's a better RPO coach. Think about the quarterbacks that that Nick Sirianni has coached. Phillip Rivers. Guys who were pure drop back guys, not RPO guys. So a guy that was more in tune with the RPO system was Shane Steichen. Made sense. Nick saw it too. He wanted to be the head coach of the Eagles. Guarantee you, Frank Reich told him, hey, they want to take the play calling away. You don't think he had that conversation with Frank? Frank went like this probably. Go ahead. Let him. Because then it's their call. Do you understand that they have now, what they did by doing that and having a guy with play calling, Okay, with play calling duties. He's a scapegoat now, not Sirianni. They like Nick. They want Nick to be the head coach of this team for a long time. So the way you do that, don't have a head coach who's a play caller. Now, get this. Now the head coach is out of harm's way when it comes to being fired if something goes south. You don't have to fire your guy. You could fire the guy under him. He's the play caller. You hired him. Can't fire a guy who's the head coach if you bring in Brian Johnson. That was an organizational decision, not a Nick Sirianni decision. Because if Nick makes that decision, he's fired. Okay? There's not a person that believes that Nick Sirianni's in control of that locker room. Absolutely not. You think they're going to try to save Nick from him? His own undoing. 
you think they were going to try to save Nick from his own? Yeah, when he was two and five, absolutely. They saw it wasn't going anywhere. They saw it wasn't going anywhere. Then they got on a run, and they never looked back. They and and and, and they like him. Doug Peterson would never have given up play calling duties. Never happened. Nick actually saved himself from himself with that move. Whereas Doug would have gained, well, he did get canned. Today's NFL coach is Nick Sirianni. He's not a one of. The coaches all over the league like that. Like, look at, look at the Los Angeles Chargers. They bring in Kellen Moore. Do you actually think Brandon Staley brought that guy in and hired him? Come on. Tom Telesco and the Spanos family brought that guy in. For what reason? Because they thought the offense wasn't going anywhere. Brandon Staley kept the job because he goes along with it. And the organization is hiring assistant coaches like that. Here's a better one. The offensive coaches in uh, New York with the Jets were hired before Aaron Rodgers got there and it enticed them because they brought Nathaniel Hackett in. You actually think that Robert Saley, the, the head coach of the Jets, had any say in that? Absolutely not. He had no say in that. Let me play ball with you for a second. Is it possible how he pulled him to a side and said, look, I like you. And I know you like calling plays, but I can't save you if you screw this up. Actually, I probably think that Frank – here, here, Tone, personally, I think that probably Frank went to him and said, hey, look, you're two and five. And if I were you, Shane – because remember what he said about Frank. Frank Wright is his mentor. Frank Wright is his confidant. They talk, what did he say? Three times a week. I guarantee you, and somewhere in those conversations in the first seven games, that Frank said to him, hey, I'm going to tell you something. Shane is a better RPO guy than you. See, when you're friends like that, and you guys have done a lot of work with one another, I didn't realize Sirianni was in San Diego when I was covering the Chargers. I didn't realize he was a wide receiver coach. And he'd been around him a long time. And I wouldn't be shocked if Frank and him had talked it out and then Sirianni actually went to um, Howie and said, hey, you know what? We might want to try to give him the opportunity to call plays. I would say that that could have been even in the conversation. And then they came to a, an agreement. Everyone in the office had said, let's, let's, let's give the play calling over. It probably was a mutual understanding. So you think Frank helped Sirianni get ahead. Frank Reich helped him get the job in the first place. Why wouldn't he help him keep his job? And remember something. I don't know, Tone, if you were doing the show with me or not, but when Frank came on, he told you he had been offered the offensive coordinator's job already before the Panthers offered him the head coaching job. I mean, he was going to be the offensive coordinator in Philadelphia, Frank Reich. They had already offered it to him. He said it here. Go back and listen. Then he got the Panther job. So you don't think there was any kind of like tie into that? Frank Reich was going to be the offensive coordinator in Philadelphia if he didn't get the Panther job. I point blank asked him, did Philly reach out to you? And get this, it hadn't been made official yet that Steichen was the Colts head coach. He goes, yeah, you know, we had conversations about me being the coordinator. Then he stopped. <laughs> Makes sense? Sirianni followed Frank everywhere he went. It's actually JM. There's a tree. Mike McCoy, the former head coach of the Chargers, Doug Peterson, Sirianni, and Frank Reich. There's a couple more guys that were on that coaching staff in Indianapolis that were with Frank in Buffalo, Philly, and in Los An or San Diego with the Chargers that he had built this kind of like coaching tree with 
and there's there's a bunch of guys, but it's McCoy. Here, here's here's the guys that have their own little like click here, and it's Doug Peterson, Mike McCoy. Where's Mike? Do you guys know where Mike McCoy is now? Okay. I like this segment, Sills. You're talk, talking us into the dark rooms where the uncensored NFL conversation. Hey, well, do, somebody do me a favor. Google Mike McCoy, coach. Tell me where he is. I'm assuming he's with one of those guys right now. Mike McCoy is either with Frank, he's with Doug, or he could be even in Indianapolis right now. Um, he, he could be one of those guys, a former head coach of the Colts or of the uh, Chargers. So um, I, I I don't really know where he is. Huh. Mike McCoy is a quarterback coach in Jacksonville. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> That's why you guys, you, hey, always know you, you, get, you get caught in a, like, here, here, here was the here was the here was the Bill Walsh kind of tree kind of thing. Holmgren, Shanahan, Seifert had a bunch of guys that were on that coaching staff at one time. McKittrick, and so what they have is they have this group, and you know why they have this group was when these guys go out and become a head coach. And you get fired because of something. You have places to land. You you have places to land. Frank was never not going to be a head coach or an assistant coach again, because he could have get this. He could have been the he could have been the offensive coordinator in not in Indy, but in Arizona, Philadelphia, or Jacksonville, if he so chose. He wanted Philly because why? He loves the organization, and they love him. He He's the guy that recommended Sirianni to Jeffrey Lurie. You know this. He said that also here. It, what, what's funny about it is you guys don't remember Frank Reich on this program saying, when I asked Frank the question, hey, who recommended Sirianni to the Eagles? He goes, I did. Was this in the middle of the Wentz deal? He goes, yeah. Frank Wright is the reason Nixon – why do you think he jumped on that park bench at Arizona? Or no, in Indy. Why do you think he jumped on that bench? Because if it wasn't for Frank, he's never the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Frank was the reason he got the job. You guys are talking stupid-ass Nick – Lincoln Riley. <laughs> Lincoln Riley. Oh, boy. When I, when, when I heard John Ritchie throwing that bullshit out – now, I've thrown some shit out in my day. But even, even I went, Lincoln Riley, head coach. Didn't you learn your lesson with dumbass Chip Kelly? <laughs> Man, what in the world were you thinking that Chip, that Lincoln Riley would have ever chose? And by the way, Lincoln Riley needed to only stay one more year to get a $6 million. Um, what was that thing called? It was called... Um, it was called because he had been there for such a period of time. They gave him a six million dollar bonus for a long, like a longevity bonus for being there over ten years. They gave him six million extra. <laughs> dude, John Rich, dude, I love John Ritchie, man. He's not bad either. But Lincoln Riley, the head coach of the Eagles, they probably spoke to him. But come on, man, they probably spoke to him because of Jalen, not because of being the head coach. That's invested, JM. I think that's what it was. All right. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> hey, nine games that I think are going to be difficult ball games for the Eagles this year, and I'm going to tell you why. And these are games that, get this, boy, I'll tell you something. You look at that schedule a little bit more, it looks pretty tough. Hit the like button. Power hour's coming up. I appreciate you guys coming aboard. Please keep it here on the national.